Science is more than a body of knowledge. It is a way of thinking, a way of skeptically interrogating the universe. A very good morning one and all. Reva Business School was founded with a long-term goal of educating and equipping the upcoming generations of managers and executives to create sustainable enterprises that will not only allow them to achieve educational, then operational success, but also to investigate novel business models. With highly qualified staff and compete in management, Reva Business School offers its students a fantastic learning environment and promote intellectual, social, ethical, and development, and so equips them to pursue successful careers. SciTech Lecture Series. Explore the forefront of science and technology through our competitive lecture series. Renowned experts delve into cut-edging research, innovations, and future trends. We'll be having insightful discussions, interactions, and sessions journey into the realm of discovery. To enlighten us more, we have with our an outstanding personality, which gives me an immense pleasure to welcome our today's speaker, Dr. Vijay Sakuja. We welcome you, sir. With immense gratitude, I would like to welcome our Honorable Chancellor, Dr. P. Shamaraju, who has always been an instrumentally creating desired student platform. We welcome you, sir. I'd like to welcome our Vice Chancellor for his unceasing support. I'd like to welcome all the deans, directors, faculties, and students. We welcome you all. Dr. Vijay Sakuja was a former director at National Maritime Foundation, New Delhi. He has also been a faculty for several think tanks and universities in India and abroad. Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, Singapore, Cambodia Institute of Corporation and Peace, Cambodia, Senior Fellow at Center for Air Power Studies and Observer Research Foundation, a research fellow at the University of Defense Institute and Analysis and United Service Institute of India, Rashtriya Raksha University, Gandhinagar, Siksha O Anusandan Bhuvaneshwar. A former Navy officer, Dr. Vijay Sakuja received his Master of Philosophy and PhD degrees from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Mr. Sakuja has published over 50 books, edited and co-edited volumes of monography on geopolitics, technology, climate change, blue economy, and maritime history. Some of his important works are Asian Maritime Power in 21st Century, Strategic Transaction, China, India, South Asia, then Nagapatnam to Suvarnadipa, a reflection on the Chola Naval Expedition to Southeast Asia, a fourth industrial revolution technology, maritime and naval operations, etc. His publications are Indo-Pacific, Vistas for India-Japan Relation and Cooperation 2023, Maritime Security Complexes of India-Pacific Region 2020, and so on. He is a member of International Editorial Board of Journal of Indian Ocean Region, a journal of Indian Ocean Ream Studies, a journal of Greater Macam Studies. Dr. Vijay Sakuja is currently supervising four PhD scholars. Now, I'd request our chancellor and dignitaries to felicitate our guest. The session is over to Dr. M. Sakuja.
Very good morning. I will take two minutes because I have to leave. I have, Dr. Sakuja has to pardon me for this. I have uh, one more meeting which is, uh, I have to attend uh, immediately. Uh, I was uh, always dreaming and insisting students should have uh, knowledge earned through sessions like this and uh, hands-on experience, uh, project-based learning. This uh, started uh, from last two years, particularly RBS started distinct lecture, see a lecture series where forget about the children uh, learning, I am learning. Whenever I get the opportunity to hear the uh, guests like uh, Dr. Sakuja. <coughs> see, uh, I don't know, Tripoli uh, students are here? Who oh, in, involved in the project? I think morning itself I told I want to see you differently and all your houses should be erect, that is uh, having the solar power installed by you, yourself. That is what I told. I think that we, uh, I think your director, your teachers will be knowing. Once I say, I will be following up. I will not keep uh, forget and uh, keep quiet. Why I am telling this? I am going on telling in uh, four five years time. All my children who are studying here should be job providers, not job seekers. For that, to educate you, to mold you like that, to train you like that, this lecture series are very, very important. Whatever subject you hear, your teachers teach, that will have, you will gain uh, book knowledge to a certain extent, maybe with uh, practicals or with projects they made teach you. But the experience, what our uh, distinct lecturers who are giving, they will share their experience. Example is Dr. Sakuja, you can see his experience. I, we, we were there only, uh, interacted only a couple of minutes, but in that I could gain a lot of things. He will be there uh, on uh, February 27th and 28th with us. He is also one of the panel member. We are going to have geopolitics uh, session with uh, in Reva University, if I am not wrong, we are the second university, second or third university in the country having this. We are establishing that. <clears throat> so all these 450 students who are sitting here, definitely you should learn a lot. Concentrate here. And I, if I am not wrong, he will be giving opportunity for interactive. The question and answers will be there. Uh, any distinguished uh, lecturer who are coming, who are all coming here, they love to have this uh, question and answer uh, sessions, where even uh, they will assess the quality of students and the high IQ levels of my children who are studying here, what type of uh, quality students we have in the university, and attracting to the courses like uh, whatever course you are studying here. I wish you all the best. Make use of this. Uh, with your permission, I have to leave, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think uh, for me, it's a unique pleasure. Um, I was escaping Delhi of a severe cold, and I, my daughter lives here, so I said I'm coming to you because I feel very uncomfortable there. And uh, sure enough, he says, welcome to Bengaluru. But I got another pleasant surprise while I, was, while I was preparing to come here. I get an invitation to come to your beautiful university for this conference, which is going to take place next month. And that's what triggered me that and I called up and I said, can I come and vi visit your university? And for me, I think uh, the entire visit so far has turned out to be a, a kind of a mesmerizing if visit. I've met the top leadership and I'm now interacting with you. 
for the next 30, 35 minutes that I'm going to speak, uh, I'm going to share with you, and as Honorable Chancellor said, in terms of we will switch roles, that time I'll become a student and you'll become my teacher asking questions. Uh, with that, I've chosen a very interesting subject, blue economy, and I've been working on it for almost about a decade plus. And uh, these days, fashionable to give colors to economies the green economy, greening the economy. Uh, if you go up north in latitudes, they say white economy, the so-called the Arctic economy. So uh, if you see, there is a kind of each geography that we are in will generate a certain amount of economy. We generally put it in a broader rubric called economy. But then each one has got its own peculiarities. And this is where the terra firma, or for that matter, the geography, which is going to determine it. And I've chosen blue economy. Of course, uh, Indian prowess in science and technology, that's where I'm going to excite you into a new domain, a new world, which is going to be coming up. We'll start thinking in terms of what is going to be 10 years from now, 15. You are the guys who are going to be those holding those skill sets. That will be how I will move. I'll, as a matter of fact, I will socialize you into blue economy. Talk about the new blue economy, and then thereafter will be something that is where we'll all ponder over with that as the background. Next slide, please. Let's get back to our geography class. We always had this map coming in, and I think most of us scored 9 out of 10 or 10 out of 10, because we had our geography right. And we always were told, okay, which is Atlantic, which is which sea, etc., Indian Ocean, all those things were there. And then, did we ever think about it, because this was a flat map, did we ever think about it that 70% of the Earth's surface is water? That means the terra firma that we are on is just about 30%. What about this 70% out of sight, out of mind? We don't know. You go to the waterfront, I'm sure you've all gone to Mangal uh, New Mangalore or Mangalore and then gone on to the waterfront over there or gone to Goa, wet your feet but you didn't know what's beyond 10 kilometers. It was something there is. Of course, in the, in the horizon, you see a ship, et cetera, et cetera, fishermen coming in, et cetera. But then you didn't know what was beyond. And of course, you didn't know what was under the water, unless you had watched 20,000 leagues under the sea. Old movie that was there. So what we find is the blue, it's called the blue planet because it covers 70% of the water. Next slide, please. And what do we get from the water, from this so-called the 70%? The air we breathe, cleaning, transportation. We get, of course, I mentioned about Goa, recreation, economy, all right? Climate regulation. These are the things that we get over there. Fish, plenty that we get over there. And of course, now into, we are into biotechnology, marine biotechnology, we are all going to look at medicines, etc. This all forms a part of what we could call as ocean economy. How much is it percentage of the global GDP is still being determined? If it is still being determined, or we just have rough estimates, clearly goes to show we know so little about this environment. And it, 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 each passing day, we are trying to gain more and more. And I'm hopeful that another five, 10 years, we'll become much more conversant, much more educated, much more informed about what is at sea, on the surface, and underwater. Next one, please. This gentleman, Gunter Pauli, he wrote a book. And he titled it Blue Economy. And he argued the focus should shift from identifying the problem to finding solutions. Now, his was more of a concept. You've all heard about circular economy, sustainability. As a matter of fact, today, when you get, every time you get up in the morning, first word which strikes you is sustainability. They teach you sustainability. You write sustainability. You got already socialized into sustainability. The word sustainability all along features into every possible sector or vertical that you are engaged in. Now, his aim was, 10 years, 100 innovations, and 100 million jobs. And the idea was, he was talking about greening. Now, this greening was a very, very important factor. Now, you'd wonder why I'm talking about greening, and I'm talking about the oceans, the blue, etc., etc. 
So this whole concept of greening was across the board and everybody said, let's go green. The island states got up and said, we hardly have any land. What are you talking about greening? We have only oceans. That's our environment. We have to preserve it. How do I green the oceans? So they said, why don't we call it a blue economy? And that was the transition. That's where at the United Nations, the concept paper on blue economy came about. Next slide, please. What is it then, blue economy? Let's look at the sectors. Let's, we've got a very broad general definition. And as a student, it's always first thing is, what is the definition? We all began with that school days. Is the integration of water-based economy, including inland water body. We tend to forget that the lakes, the reservoirs, even a small pond is capable of generating a certain revenue or an economy. And ocean economy development with the principle of social inclusion, environmental sustainability, and innovative dynamic business model. Very, very loaded definition. Now, each of these things we start unfolding like an onion. You know, keep peeling it. You keep understanding one by one by one. Still, you'll not say, I have really not got what the definition is all about. But for the purpose of our lecture this morning, we will just take it to see, read as that it is something that we're going to generate, something which is sustainable out of the oceans and seas and water transport. Next slide, please. You'll be surprised. Can you see that ship over there? I've just put it, this came about last year, MSC Irina. It carries 24,346 containers. You would have seen on this highway containers going up and down. You never know what's inside. How, where are they coming in? Imagine you've got about 25,000 containers on a ship. Which one is going to go first? Which is going to be loaded? You can't remove whole lot and then load the next lot. It's a complex thing. And how we have pelletized, the word is pelletized, made them into pellets, our cargo, put them into these containers, 40 foot, your big ones are 40 foot, smaller ones are 20 foot. We put them together, box them up, and then put them onto, uh, onto the ship and let it go. The length is about 400 meters. You can well imagine what is 400 meters, stretching on and on and on. Width, of course, 61 meters. is the world's largest container. What is probably of interest to us would be 90% of the global trade moves by the sea route. 50,000 merchant ships as of this moment will be at sea. I'm talking about big ships. I'm not talking about smaller vessels. Will be always at sea carrying what? Containers, that is finished goods, oil, gas, LNG, grain, variety of things. And those of us who've been at sea as a mariner, you find every time you're moving across to a particular narrow channel, variety, variety of ships that are there carrying different types of cargo. It's a fascinating world. It's a busy place. Fantastic amount of cargo is moving. And many of us who are now, say, our wrist, our wrist watches or devices, et cetera, what we notice is something. Where did they come? They came by the sea route. We never noticed that. We always talk about supply chains, coming sources, coming from China, coming from where. How did they reach up? They all came by this massive container. And what we have about 150 countries who are maritime states and over, 100, uh, and over a million seafarers all along. That is the what I would call as a maritime ecosystem. Next slide, please. Fish. Three billion people rely on fish as their primary source of protein. It's a huge number. Literally, as of now, we would call it about 43, 44% of the global population. 40% higher, the global fish harvest could be 40% higher if we were to use sustainable practices. There is indiscriminate fishing going on at sea. Juvenile fish is caught, they never grow. Some areas are polluted heavily, they never find a marine ecosystem. The food chain, the marine food ecosystem or the chain that they follow is destroyed. So you have a huge number of data that is available. I'll skip that. That is not the purpose. Go ahead with the next slide, please. Offshore, oil and gas. And now we have, Vice Chancellor just now mentioned about solar power, solar panels. We are moving the solar farms out to sea. We are building up windmills out at sea so that we are able to generate green energy. The offshore is the new destination, the new territory which is green and sustainable. 
that is where we would be requiring because that is one area which is still a vacuum in terms of expertise, particularly in the context of our country. We have not yet gone in. You, you all have got your devices, you're on the internet 24 seven, you're watching movies. Where did this all this data come from? Underwater fiber optic cables. Where did the oil and gas come from? Pipelines. Now we are also producing electricity as we will start producing offshore, we are going to be bringing in electricity from there, underwater electric, DC current. So the underwater, or for that matter, the maritime medium is the new, what I would call as an arena, in which now we are learning more about it, and we are going to use it more and more. We've already gone into seabed mining. I'm sure several of you are studying in terms of energy transitions, batteries, minerals, critical minerals, they all have to come. There is shortage on land. So we are going towards the sea. Will it be sustainable? Today the debate is, of course there are minerals down there. Is it sustainable to extract? How will it impact on the entire ecosystem? These are the challenges which are coming up. Next slide, please. Salt, I, this must fascinate you. You would love to go on a cruise liner. Luxury. This is a new, not a new, it's an old industry, but it is growing rapidly. And now, India is turning out to be a destination where cruise liners are making a port call. And it's always a pleasure to try and go on board a ship. You'll enjoy it, I can tell you. Seeing it, such a huge city by itself, but then being on board will be great. There are short voyages, they're starting those. Like we, what we have now is Mumbai to Goa. Next slide, please. So what does it all mean? I've talked about goods, I've talked about services, I've got a variety of things which we see, we don't see, ecosystem services. Ladies and gentlemen, the value is about 24 trillion. It's a huge kitty to be dipped in, dived in, picked out, and find yourself relevant to this 24 trillion. While you study here, you're also developing certain skills. And there is a lot to fish from it. And what is the value? Direct output, 6.9 trillion. Trade and transport, 5.2. Productive coastline. Coastline itself, that is the arena, the terrain that we are going to be talking about. Carbon absorption, we tend to forget. Where does all this carbon dioxide that we are going to be emitting on terra firma, where does it go? Oceans and seas are the carbon sink. They're absorbing everything, which we don't know how much is the value. So. We have a tentative figure, what we call as $24 trillion, but then the services, when added, compounded, they could be phenomenal. Because this is one arena, as I mentioned in the beginning, you go to the waterfront, you just see about eight or nine kilometers, thereafter you don't know what is beyond and what is underwater, because we have not known about the maritime medium. Next slide, please. But, all this nice story of $24 trillion. Our oceans and seas are under distress. Ocean acidification, oxygen depletion, coral bleaching, oil pollution, accident. And I'm going to talk about something which you and I, on a daily basis, are contributing to the so-called distress of the seas. You see that picture there in the corner, that tablet over there? Sea level rise. And India is going to be suffering from sea level. Ba Bangladesh is going to be, uh, Bangladesh is already at a critical situation. It's rising. Coastline is going through a st major stress. And this is what it shows you, 2030, uh, two the water line will be there, and then 2050, 2050, it'll move up. The seas and oceans are under a lot of distress. The next, please. We don't care when we put that bottle away, or water bottle, cigarette butts, variety of things that go on over mm -hmm. there, plastic bags, bottle caps, straws, stirrers, indiscriminately we pick up. All this goes into the drain, a large amount, because pre reprocessing or recycling is very weak, and all of them land up into the sea. Global river systems contributing 1.15 to 2.41 million metric tons per annum. This is the plastic. And we have a very serious situation, ladies and gentlemen, at sea. What we call as gyres, these are huge islands of plastic. 
they're all there in the Indian Ocean, Bay of Bengal, Arabian Sea, all along our coast, and they're affecting the entire ecosystem. This is the kind of stress that the oceans and seas. You would have seen those pictures on the YouTube or elsewhere in the, on the internet about you know, tortoise entangled in nets. It's so distressful. Fishing nets are there. Every possible, it is turned into a global dump yard. Because we don't see it. We don't get to know about it. Now that we are getting technology, we are seeing, we are going there, reaching out on those destinations, we are now trying to realize what do we do. Even the cosmetics that we use have got microns in it, plastic. They are going in. I recall a conference I was in Dhaka and I told my friends over there, my uh, friends over there, I said, what, Hilsa is your popular fish, Hilsa has got plastic. They were after me. I said, how can you say that? And today we find the research tells us that fish, almost every possible fish is now with microplastic or nanoplastics. The amount of plastics that we have generated and the amount of plastic which has gone into the sea and the oceans, very difficult to manage. Governments have woken up, there are calls, but then it's a long, long way to go for us. Next, please. <clears throat> The entire ecosystem, as I said, is under this. 90% of the big fish is gone. 10% could go in 40 years. 75% stocks exploited, depleted. 20 mit, uh, million metric ton bycatch. Bycatch is what you, if you want to catch one part, type of fish, but you get other fish also entangled into it. That bycatch is phenomenal. Destructive fishing practices, bottom trawling, sea mounds take decades. I mean, there is a, a, a kind of... Uh, a problem which is going on at sea. Because we don't see it. We don't get to know about it. But we have a problem at hand. Next slide, please. I come to the next part of it. I've given you the opportunities. I've given you the challenges. Now we are talking about, we are into a digital age. Now in this digital age, what do we bring? What, how do we harness these technologies? And several of you are studying you know, in, as part of your curriculum here, artificial intelligence, big data, internet of things, variety of things are there. And we find that each one of the technologies that you are studying has a relevance in the maritime ecosystem. And imagine that you have, your skill sets are going to be contributing to the 24 trillion that I talked about, that you are important stakeholders. Because you didn't know about the maritime medium, you're not aware of the maritime medium, but there are huge opportunities exist for your skill sets. And let's see what are they. Next, please. We all used to use the term <clears throat> ocean economy. We changed to blue economy because we, we were talking about blue because we added sustainability into it. Now we are talking about the new blue economy, which is uses technology, data, and information to catalyze public and private sector innovation and inform smart decision making across all blue economy sectors. It's like an overarching umbrella. That is where the future is. That is where this technology will be needed. And as I said, our oceans and seas are, in, are under dis distress. They need to be looked after. But then there are huge opportunities, as I said. There are also challenges. So how do we define it? Essentially, it would run in terms of sustainable, I have to bring in. Because the word sustainable is not gone. It is not gone away from our lexicon or the dictionary. Equitable ocean, coastal and inland economy that optimizes advances in science and technology to create value-added, data-driven economic opportunities and solutions for pressing society. Big, again, very massive, loaded definition. And if you go back to that movie, Three Idiots, why can't you say it simply? What is it? What is it that you want in the blue economy? We want technological solutions, technology solutions. And today, if we are looking at technology solutions, I think the industry 4.0 technologies, as we call it, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, center of, uh, you know, your physical systems, cyber physical systems, all this is needed. Next, please. So, it, it, has technology, is something technology new to the maritime system? Oh, no, far from it. If you really look at it, I've got a very interesting infographic and I 
purposely put it here. Society one, if these days fashionable to talk about, you know, giving it 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. And I chose that. Society 1.0 is hunter society. We've all learned in our school days. 2.0 agrarian society, 3.0 industrial society. We are into 4.0. And we are heading towards society 5.0, smart, right? Again, in the industry, similar things happened. You look at industry 4.0, digitalization and cyber physical systems. And the last one, cognitive computing. Now, if you look at what is all this is going on, AI, ML, I talked about quantum communication, you're all familiar with. Blockchain, 5G, heading into 6G. Fiber optic cables, I briefly mentioned about those. Data storages, all your film that you watch on Netflix, Amazon, and everything, they're lying in data storages. And those data storages are lying underwater. There are big, big kind of projects which are going on underwater. Because we don't see it. When you don't see it, you don't understand it or you don't believe it. Wearable technologies, you are already into it. We're talking about, this will be fascinating. Kirigami, origami, varigami. This is the Japanese art of folding and cutting. Imagine how we miniaturize all this. Our lunar Mars, that module which went up, it was unfolding. If you find at the foundational level, it was essentially folding and then unfolding. And then we are talking about Warigami. Now, Warigami is a combination which, as militaries are now trying to bring it, miniaturize everything. So we use the term called as Warigami. Biomimetics, we are now creating digital models of dolphins, putting as much as electronics and data technologies inside to understand the oceans. How? Or to understand the dolphins themselves. Because you put a foreign and an alien kind of a creature in their school, Obviously, they'll be, they will revolt. So we are now turning every possible creature, crawlers, etc. The crawlers which have gone to the space actually are the crawlers on the seabed. We are borrowing from them. All activity that they do is now being put into using kirigami, origami, and then with, loaded with digit, digitalizations, and they're moving in. Digital twinning. It's become very, very important. I don't need to be, today my ship is at sea, it's going on, but on shore I can sit and watch each, the health of each and every machinery or the equipment that is on board. So I've created digital twins. I'm watching each one of the sensors which are feeding me back into to understand what is to be done, etc. which is at distress, which is not at distress, which needs to be replaced at the next port of call. AI cyber, you're familiar. Singularity, this is, ladies and gentlemen, it is something we believe 2040, the machines would have become smarter than the humans. It is not a good moment. It is a dangerous moment because machines will become indiscriminate, indiscriminate in their approach to doing things. There will be no empathy. There is no emotion. There is no concern. And we wanted to stop here. At 2040, let it not spill over into the other part where it becomes all smarter. And then we ask us as humans who have certain ethics, morality. How do we convert ethics and morality into, or which comes from science, which tells you, heart tells you, brain tells you. How do we convert that into digital technologies? So for me, as a scholar, the worry is 2040 is a dangerous time when the machine becomes smarter than me. It's good, it's going to do all kinds of things. But it must do reasons. That's why we have a wave called as stop the killer robots. We'll move, we are moving at a very leapfrogging, rapid trajectory, but it is a dangerous trajectory in terms of speed. And 2040, please, if some of you study this part of the so-called singularity, you'll find that it's a very fascinating subject. Next slide, please. So if you look at the ships, we started with sail, Wooden hull, you would have seen those boats, you know. Went on to steam power, iron hull, diesel power, now 4.0, autopilot. We use digital technologies. We are talking about autonomous ships, 5.0, 6.0. And then, ladies and gentlemen, we are also going back to 
what I would call as ship 1.0. We have now sail ships, but they are digitized. So it is a circle by itself coming back. Digital twinning, as I said, I can see what's happening. My ship is outside physically, but in my control room, sitting on shore, Mumbai, Bangalore, wherever I am, I can see what my ship is doing. Fuel is changing, as I said, wind, coal, oil, LNG, biofuel, hydrogen. So when you're talking about energy transitions, also at the back of your mind think there is energy transition which is going on into the maritime world. It's happening all over. Next, please. We'll skip this. The next one. So what I, we are talking about conservation. And, you know, businesses, they say, what, what's there for me? How much of money I'm going to make? What are my returns? I'm going to invest so much of money into it. So conservation and restoration, we are trying to do, this is a new, unique kind of a new upcoming field in which we are be doing a lot of work on this. Returns are going to be about 3%. Decarbonization in shipping, phenomenal business. Phenomenal business, 4%. Marine fisheries and aquaculture, we are taking farming. I understand you have started one, one particular department for agriculture. Look at agriculture which is underwater, seagrass, food, aqua. That is going to be our next granary, if I may use, because rich in protein. Offshore wind and energy, I talk about wind farms, solar farms. This is the kind of return. The next one, please. Disruptive. I use the term, as a matter of fact, every morning I get up, I, tend, I tell myself, disrupt yourself, think different. They always tell you, and we've also been told, us, you, all, everyone's told, think out of the box. My advice to you, it would be, think without the box. Disrupt. Just think, go wild, talking about interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary. You just got to think, go wild. Each of your unique vertical that you are engaged in has got a relevance in another vertical. We would, I would have never thought about fish beyond, but today I'm talking about fish to be monitored, their health, etc., ecosystem, technology. Everything is now getting connected with this. Is nothing that technology is superior or humans are less superior, et cetera, et cetera. You would have to think what we call as without the box. Disrupt yourself. And some of the disruption that will come from the technology, particularly in the SNT, we are talking about manufacturing sensors, instruments, platform, digital data, data management. Data is the king. How do you manage that data? It's a huge industry where there are huge opportunities. We are talking about $33 trillion. Now, if we were to combine $24 trillion, another $33 trillion, imagine the kind of investment that will go in, the opportunities that exist. Next, please. Well, it's the entire concept of blue economy is high on the agenda. And today, we have approximately, our uh, blue economy is about 4% of the GDP. And this morning, during the brief chat, I mentioned about, do we know what is the percentage of marine economy in Karnataka's GDP? Because we've not thought about it. But if we were to start putting our, invest our intellectual capital into it, we'll find answers. Because that helps you which are the thrust areas the government must invest in. Analyze it. It is not to demonize anything. Because we didn't know about it, now we know about it. Let's use it, put it to, let's identify the thrust areas. Blue economy occupies a vital potential position in India's economic growth. This is a given. It is a given. Next one, please. You heard about Sagar Mala. We're talking about port development projects. It runs across the, that's why we're talking about, that's where our ocean economy is going to be coming in, in terms of trade, transportation. And we've got certain expertise now in terms of excellence in those many terms of taking what we call as Matsya. This underwater module is going to go 6,000 meters and carry out underwater study and exploration for critical mill. Next, please. So let us look at it. We are coming to the last part of my presentation. Uh, entrepreneurs, MSMEs, innovations, jobs, skill development is there. It is just that how well, how familiar you are, 
how much of intellectual investment that you want to make in how do you see yourself more important how do you see yourself in this so called the ecosystem which is going to be talking about all this innovation and related to marine economy it's a industry science partnership it doesn't happen only in academia academia is the one which is going to hold the foundation that is university your university is going to hold the foundations on which the entire industry and science will develop and maybe you'll find that what i would call as next slide please entrepreneurs blues finding solution to critical blue economy there are several problems you just have to go in identify a problem and i think the entrepreneurs are sitting in 450 of you if you are here you are the ones who are going to give us the solution there are numerous problems which the drdo can't do it our science labs can't do it they are all lying here and we have to harness the economic potential of the oceans but please remember in a sustainable manner create jobs values for coastal communities as such so blue labs blue careers blue technology the next one the question is is our university today primed for that that is what is going to be requiring a great introspection i'm not suggesting violent changes in curriculum but try to socialize the maritime medium around the vertical that you are in next please so blue growth entrepreneurs etc new products sustainable next please so is there something called as oceans at river i look forward to it and what i am looking for is i can't give you gunter pauli gave us 10 years i can't give you 10 years i need in 5 years 200 innovations this will create 200 million jobs this could be the mantra think about it and you have an opportunity next please there's always this tendency among scholars to promote the academic work i'm taking that liberty uh, i did two volumes on blue economy fascinating experience then i wanted to link it up with the industry a, a, a 4.0 i worked on that and this is something for the business people studies etc management studies we are into what we call as fikis task force on blue economy the third report has just come out on last saturday and we are yet to upload it but as soon as i get a copy i'll share it with the university i'll stop here thank you very much i also have a reminder we always get this reminder time is up thank you very much <clears throat> sure now we have question and answer sessions students who would like to answer any question ask any questions kindly raise tell introduce yourself then go ahead with your questions Yes please Uh hello sir I'm Aditya and I'm in third year of engineering my question was how critical is AI in uh disrupting the entire uh distress that's on the blue economy see firstly we are now in a process just to even get the data now once we get the data then we are able to map where exactly the sources are today we are able to figure out uh, give you a very interesting example in the andamans we found a trash we had difficulty where did it come from you have to get back to the source right we found its source coming all the way from mumbai how some of the labels and the wrappers that were there we were able to figure it out that is like a kind of a james bond sub you trace it back but then when you took it to the larger part of it where is it, this whole thing coming in from so using this artificial intelligence we are trying to figure out where these sources are which are the rivers which are polluting more etc etc you are able to build up a database which will help us and also find remedies and solutions so what we need is sensors we need 
in terms of study of the data, data analysts. So it's a, it's a full-fledged kind of a system which manually will become extremely impossible to determine. Just a lead to say, okay, this was the label which came in and today we are going to use this technology to look at it. So following that, my other question is, how far behind are we when we compare AI with daily use and uh, something uh, related to our like terrain environment, how far is it in the ocean compared to on land? Like the See, developments in it. On land, we are already digitized. We know everything. We know where the university is, right? We've gone ex really aggressive in terms of data compilation and data management and upgrading it. But at sea, it has not been possible. Not that technology is not there, because the need was not there. Now that the need has come, you know, we want to see how much of carbon dioxide is it absorbing. I just can't put a you know, pillar. How do I put a pillar? I can't create a post. So I'm going to use certain amount of, let's say, infrastructure in terms of spatial or otherwise, and then determine it. So land, to my mind, is about 80, 90% mapped, reasonably mapped. I'll use the word reasonably. Oceans and seas, no, I'm sorry, it's not there. And the underwater domain, as I said, it's a Davy Jones locker. That means once goes, something goes in, we don't know what's happening. We had no idea. You'll be surprised, we had no idea. Baby whales were now washing ashore along the Tamil Nadu coast, right? And a kind of investigation into the reason which found that inside their stomach were huge jerry cans. Because they open their mouth, they don't know what's coming in. So they've taken it in. The breathing goes on, everything goes on, but the stomach tells you, sends a message, I'm full. It doesn't need more fish to eat. But then they were losing weight, and then they were losing their senses. They were washing ashore. So we don't know what's happening over there. And what kind of, let me say, litter we have left over there, created here on land and left it over there. So oceans and seas remain unmapped. Charted, yes, unmapped, as far as digital mapping is concerned. Yes, sir, right at the back. Hi, sir. I'm Niranjan. So from the beginning of the session, you were just talking about how to make money. So how to save the ocean, sir, using those technologies? Oceans are an industry by themselves. <clears throat> That I mentioned about goods and services that generates revenue. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so what you have over there is an opportunity. As I gave you some figure about $24 trillion. Yes, sir. I talked about disruptive technology, another $33 billion, $33 trillion, right? So this is the kind of, let's say, a kitty available to you, both in terms of, we are talking about investments, in terms of revenues, variety of things, et cetera. So uh, let's not call it a making money. Of course, businesses demand that necessitate that you must make money. After all, profits have to be generated out of it. So there is huge opportunity which is coming, and technology is helping them make, make money. So we are just destructing the environment, no, sir? No, we are not destructing. We, are, we have to manage it as the word sustainable. Yes, sir. So you have to, what I would call as best practices, Yes, sir. best sustainable practices, and here we are talking about best blue practices. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. I am Ashika. In your experience, uh, what are the opportunities do we have in civil engineers for uh, mar maritime uh, infrastructure development, sir? See, uh, blue economy is colossal amount of infrastructure. You can talk about physical infrastructure. You can talk about digital infrastructure. The ports, the supply chain, the connectivity, the lorry system, 
shipping, shipbuilding, huge amount. So can you name some organizations uh, to provide oh, this Oh, we option? have the Sagar Mala, as I mentioned to you. Just go to the website and you'll find Sagar Mala. They are already talking about crores and crores of rupees. So infrastructure will be is something that maritime infrastructure is weak in this country. That's why the Sagar Mala project is on. We are trying to connect up with the golden quadrilateral, the, the road system, supply chains, the, uh, the production hubs to be connected. So this is all what I would call as uh, infrastructure intensive. OK, so thank you, sir. Yeah, sure. We'll have one last question. You can get up and speak. I'll be able to listen to you. Hello, sir. I'm Chandan. I'm a third year student in engineering. So I'd like to ask this question. Uh, how do you go about investing in oceans, in the ocean economy? I think I shared with you there are opportunities in every possible sector, right? Whether yeah. it is shipping, shipbuilding, port infrastructure, tourism, how do you, cruise liner. What, what advice do you give for, like, let's say I want to build a startup based on the ocean economy? It's not well established, right? So what opportunities do I get? A lot. I can tell you, you're entering into a new world altogether. We are short of new ideas, solutions to millions of problems that we have. It's just that when you sit across the table, talk to me, I'll tell you, okay, what is, what is it that you're looking at? Which sector are you looking at? Right? Then it helps. So uh, a conversation will be very useful. Okay. Thank you. The last one, give him an opportunity. You just get up and speak. We are, uh, we are uh, starting, uh, I mean, production of oil. And again, we, are, we talk about conserving the oceans, uh, reefs, and everything. How can we distinguish between these? Uh, we, we need oil. And we, are, we also talk about conserving the oceans and everything. See, the oil industry perhaps, perhaps has been demonized for simple reason. They are the big polluters, right? So there is always this worry about. And if you see any of the projects, you require a green card before that. So that is one of the checks and balances we've started. You can't cut a tree every fine moment and then say, okay, we've done with it, all right? So even there, again, the quality of oil, maybe in case the oil, and or let me call it this way, hydrocarbon section of the energy pie of the country is shrinking, right? So how much of investment we're going to be making in the hydrocarbons, which is not going away. One thing for sure, hydrocarbons are not going away. They'll be with us because the other alternative energies are going to be coming up. So it'll be a balance how do we do that. But in terms of uh, making them green, that is what the endeavor is all about, right? So that they don't infer, in, particularly in the river system, because river economy is very, very dear to a lot of people along the river, all right? For whatever transportation, fish, or whatever the reasons may be, all right? So you have to be very, very carefully looking at what projects you want to do. Is it green enough? That's why the green clearances are needed livelihoods, health, variety of things coming. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was indeed a great session. First and the foremost, I would like to thank our beloved chancellor for his unceasing support. We also take this opportunity to thank our speaker of the day for his time and valuable insights. It was an honor that you were a part of this session, sir. But. Last but not the least, we would like to thank all the deans, directors, and students of Reva University for their cooperation. Thank you one and all.